Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in front of your computer or in your office. Um, I'd like to welcome you um, today um, to the last day and final event of the Berlin Climate Security Conference, um, the second ed edition of that conference, um, to a panel discussion about the climate superpowers. Um, and I would like to take the opportunity to launch a report by the Woodrow Wilson Center and Adelphi on 21st century diplomacy, foreign policy is climate policy. Um, but before I go to the presentation, I would like to just to introduce you briefly to our panelists. I'm happy to have with us uh, Sharon Burke in Washington. Um, she is with New America, a US based uh, think tank, former uh, various high level positions um, under the Obama administration and the um, uh, Defense Ministry on Climate and Energy. I welcome from Beijing uh, in the evening, uh, Mr. Hu Yao Wang, um, who is uh, the uh, founder and president of the Center for Globalization in uh, Beijing. And I welcome Henrich Türken, uh, who is uh, the Deputy Director General in the German Foreign Office and Director for Energy and Climate and Digitalization. Um, before we turn to um, this, um, uh, the, the, the panel discussion itself, um, I see that uh, participants are just zooming in. Uh, we have more than 400 registrations and I hope that uh, some of them will join us today. I would like to take the opportunity to just uh, take you through um, the presentation of um, the report that we're supposed to launch today. Um, I hope that you can see the screen right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm very proud um, to present to you um, the report that we just launched, um, 21st Century Diplomacy, Foreign Policy is Climate Policy, a joint venture between the Environmental Change and Security Program of the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington um, and Adelphi and its Climate Diplomacy Program in uh, Berlin and joint effort uh, by a group of people. And I would like to uh, make reference to them uh, in a minute or so. Um, I just would like to, um, to tell you a little bit what the report is about and why we have initiated the report. Basically, the thinking is that um, we started with the observation that uh, foreign policy is crucial when it comes to shape and steer a process into a decarbonized world. And we've seen with the Paris Accord five years ago uh, that there is a matrix in place that basically um, more than 196 nations agreed to decarbonize the economy um, in the years to come. So the question is, assuming that climate change is basically change the way we work and live and change the systems of production, trade, economics and finance, we believe that it will and it is partly already doing um, upend the 21st century world order. And that is a challenge. And what we have seen that foreign policy working on climate change in the past couple of years, many countries have started to address the climate drivers of violent conflict and instability around the globe. Germany was one of the countries in 2011 and later this year in its membership and presidency of the UN Security Council to table climate risk in the Security Council and trigger as the UK did in 2007 and as last year did Sweden uh, in their membership and the Security Council to address the question of how can we deal with the climate drivers of conflict and how can we turn climate adaptation um, in conflicting environments and contexts into something that provides a peace dividend. That is just one part of where climate uh, foreign policy comes into the game. Uh, but we do think that it is much broader. And this is why the Wilson Center um, and the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center together with Adelphi launched this broader project to investigate into the broader meaning of the connection of climate change and foreign policy. 
Um, and we were thinking about in the beginning about seven different topics. We still remain working on the seven topics that I'd like to introduce to you uh, in a minute. And the way we did that is basically that for each of the topics, we found excellent authors to write some kind of background in-depth paper, seven pages contextual paper that tells you the story about decarbonization, the future of multilateralism, and a couple of other topics. And we invited quite prominent foreign policy practitioners and analysts from multilateral institutions, think tanks, university, NGOs, and media in order to write small op-eds. And what we want to do is just to nurture a debate, to kick off a debate about the broader meaning and the potential that foreign policy has in order to steer and shape that process uh, that leads us into a decarbonized world. As I said, it's a project uh, that we did together with uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm glad uh, to have also with us a part here um, of the participants, Lauren Reese, who is the director of the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Lauren and I uh, were running this project for a little bit more than half a year. And um, I would like to thank Lauren for her inspiration and commitment in order to run this. It was a true uh, inspiration and experience of partnership working with her and colleagues um, at the Woodrow Wilson Center. But it's not just uh, Adelphi and the Wilson Center. It is also that uh, in the beginning when we got together to think about the future of foreign policy um, that we benefited from the input and expert advice of three people, Sharon Burke, who is with us, senior advisor to New America and director of the resource security program, former different positions she held um, in the US government on energy and climate. Uh, we also had with us uh, Maxine Burkett, who is a law professor at the U University of Hawaii and director of the University's Institute for Climate and Peace. And finally, long-term collaborator Jeff DeBelko, um, senior advisor to the Wilson Center and professor at Ohio University in Athens and associate Dean at the Voinovich School um, of Leadership and uh, Public Affairs. Um, the five of us, uh, plus with the support of um, my uh, colleague Noah Gordon and Amanda King, um, we uh, selected um, the authors, we helped the authors um, to shape their papers. Uh, we had a lot of discussions about what's the role um, of um, uh, foreign policy um, in the context of the 21st century challenges. I would like to just take also the opportunity to thank two people who helped us um, to really do that and implement that project. Amanda King at the Wilson Center and Noah Gordon at Adelphi. Um, I think all the authors know them well because they did all the hard legwork uh, in getting it together. And finally, a very special thanks to Kathy Butterfield uh, for, at the Wilton Wilson Center um, who was responsible for the design of the website and the report. So thank you to everybody. Um, the way we did that, as you see, it's a collection of 28 um, uh, op-eds and essays on that topic. Um, you will see this if you go to the website. I will present you the link later in the presentation where you can download individual contributions, chapters, or the full report. But as you might have seen that uh, we have media partnerships with Project Syndicate, Erective, War on the Rocks, or the Tagesspiegel that step-by-step step already started to publishing uh, uh, some of the articles. Um, 28 essays uh, from different authors. I don't want to mention all of them, but they include Wolfgang Ischinger, head of the Munich Security Conference, uh, Lolwal al Qatar, the Assistant Foreign uh, Minister of Qatar, um, Helga Schmidt, Secretary General of the European External Action Service, Corey Shaky, Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at American Enterprise Institute, Oliver Morton, uh, the Briefings Editor at The Economist, and many, many others. So it's a quite diverse group of people, and not just transatlantic, but all over the world, uh, that we have asked to contribute from a foreign policy perspective on what we think foreign policy should do. Um, there are seven chapters. Um, one of them is climate change, equity, and the future of democracy. And the authors in this uh, paper reflect on basically two things. One is that we observe that uh, the least responsible for climate change 
are the ones who are most hit by the impacts of climate change. And that raises the question of justice. That raises the question of, um, of equity. And uh, we were thinking about this, um, the, the series of, of op-eds, um, how do we need to support communities? How do we need to uh, cooperate with countries in order to make uh, the uh, policies in responding to climate change and also dealing with the climate crisis more equitable um, in, in a just world. But also it refers to other questions of, um, of nationalism and democracy because we see that there is a proliferation of um, anti-pluralistic, partly also anti-democratic attitudes uh, by governments uh, around the globe uh, that make it far more difficult really to, uh, to implement uh, just climate policies. And maybe a third comment on that, that particularly climate change provides the DNA and the features um, in, in order to build strong societies because they build on the trust in science, they build on uh, equal participation of societal groups, etc. A second chapter um, deals with new modes of multilateralism. We do observe that there is a global trend um, of uh, disrespectful multilateral solutions. Some countries are increasingly pulling out, um, they renationalize, they reshore policies. And I think also now in the experience of dealing with the uh, COVID pandemic is that we have a reshoring of industry. So it's moving from multilateral to very much focusing on domestic unilateral approaches. The question is how we deal with that. And we do observe um, that the multilateralists, multilateralists are pleasing um, um, and, and appreciate, expressing their appreciation for multilateralism uh, as a matter of fact, but we ask the question of how does multilateralism look like? So it, are there new modes of multilateralism? Do we have to include in terms of benefiting from the ambition in driving transformative change uh, in each of the countries by sub-state and non-state act actors? Could be private, could be uh, at regional level, could be dynamic cities that provide new ways and new modes um, on transforming their economies and society. And the big question is, how do we turn this into a multilateral system, into a new modes of multilateral system? A third one deals with climate change and financial stability. Uh, climate change can leave billion dollar assets and entire sectors stranded. Stranded assets is a big topic. The value eroded by climate, by changing economic landscapes. So what should central banks, insurers and financial regulators do in order to deal with that? There is an ongoing debate by regulatory institutions in the financial sectors, what they could do in that ranges from green bonds for whether or not uh, central banks um, with their prime task of providing financial stability should engage in promoting climate change, etc. A uh, big topic. Uh, the fourth one is about the geopolitics of decarbonization. So let's imagine that uh, we are embarking into a global system that is built on renewable energy. Um, and that is eroding the system as it is. So we ask the question is, um, if that is beneficial for the entire world, and even if that is universal, who's going to benefit from that? And basically, uh, we have unequal benefits. And how are we going to balance this out? How is this going to change the regional relative power games in the region? Imagine that part of the or the entire Gulf states are decarbonizing, what would that mean for the relative power and engagement of these cities and the of these countries in the MENA region, etc. So decarbonization is going to be a bumpy road. Some people do believe and give the impression that everything is going to be green, shiny and easy. But I think it's just reorganizing um, the balance of powers as it is uh, today. If this one is dealing with climate change, migration and displacement, we all know that climate change is already a key driver in people's decision to move, whether that is migration as a form to adjust to climate change, to adapt to climate change, or whether that is forced displacement, so people are driven out of their home, out of their economies and out of their livelihoods. 
um, I think that is very much dealt with from, at least I can say, a European and a US perspective from a very national point of view, a, a very defensive point of view to basically invest into stability of um, basically making sure that people stay where they are. Um, but I think the foreign policy changes are much more complex, but what we know about migration and how that is linked to climate policy, it is a very complex web of causality. There are different forms of mobility, human mobility within countries, within um, regions that needs to be regulated and it's all about to protect life and dignity and basically to develop legal uh, equitable um, systems um, um, to regulate um, uh, migration. The sixth one is dealing with geoengineering as a matter of intervention into the earth system. Um, it's a very delicate issue. Uh, we had the impression that not, not just foreign policy makers, but mostly also the climate policy makers just don't like that debate um, because basically it would deviate a little bit from the necessity in order to drastically reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, but what would happen if deliberate large scale interventions into the natural earth systems happen? The problem is that technically it's possible. Uh, economically, it's uh, feasible and very, very cheap. Uh, but it has large scale and can have large scale cascading effects around geoengineering and particularly solar radiation management. Um, we believe that, and the authors believe, um, that it needs regulation. We need to have an honest uh, discussion about different types of geoengineering um, in order to basically reach carbon neutrality uh, by providing negative emissions. And the last one, and that's today's topic, is the actions of the US, EU, China, and India largely determine whether we can mitigate climate change. So we would like to discuss today, and we have in our different uh, contributions, uh, two of the authors are with us today, um, um, the question of what would happen with the climate superpowers? What is happening with the US uh, that declared to step out of the Paris Accord on November 4th, uh, most likely, or maybe not likely, we will see. Um, uh, what happens now with the new announcements of President Xi uh, just recently in New York uh, to become uh, climate neutral? Um, we want to discuss this today. Um, I invite everybody um, to go to the website diplomacy 21st minus adelphi.wilsoncenter.org or you just Google it, 21st century diplomacy, foreign policy is climate policy. You are invited to enter into a discussion on Twitter and other social media platforms on this. Um, this is basically, as I said, um, <clears throat> uh, what we want to do. Finally, um, I have to thank um, the Foreign Office in Berlin, the Federal Foreign Office, for providing financial support for this project and the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, we were glad um, to uh, have both funders with us. Uh, they did more than just provided funding because we had initial uh, discussions also on the structure of the report, the topics um, um, that, that they want to see in the report. Um, 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 so it was more than just a funders relation, uh, but a fruitful exchange that we had. With this, um, I would like to move to uh, today's uh, panelists. I also uh, already introduced them, uh, Professor Hu Yo, uh, Dr. Huo Wang. Center for China and Globalization in Beijing, um, Sharon Burke from New America and Hinrich Tölken from the Federal Foreign Office. My name is Alexander Karius. I'm founder and director of Adelphi, Berlin-based think tank and working for quite some time on this topic. Um, I would like to stop my presentation. Uh, everybody is online. Um, and I would like to start maybe with a discussion uh, with uh, and inviting uh, Henry Wang uh, to our discussion. I think uh, the political landscape seemed to change a little bit. Um, China will scale up its, uh, its, uh, its nationally 
um, in intended determined contributions by adopting more rigorous policy measures, as uh, President Xi uh, announced just recently, to peak uh, emissions by 2030 and to achieve carbon neutrality between uh, by by 2060 or before 2060. I think with those two short sentences, um, China's leader may have redefined the future prospects of humanity. Is that the case? And how reliable is that that this is going to be turned into practice in China? Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Alex, uh, for your excellent uh, uh, introduction and, and the hosting of this uh, event. I would also want like to uh, thank Alfie and Wilson Center for, for organizing this uh, report. And also, I, I'm very honored to be with such a very distinguished uh, panelist on this panel. I, I, I didn't know I'm <laughs> speaking first, but uh, anyway, I, 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 will, I will express my uh, uh, my thinking uh, just to uh, to open the doors for more people to to come in. I, I think we are coming to a really uh, a crossroad, a human being. You know, I mean, uh, uh, the, the the current uh, pandemic, uh, uh, you know, is uh, going on has really impacted uh, many way of, of human life, and also forced us to think very hard for the last six eight months. I mean, this this month uh, just just recently we saw the. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the 75 year anniversary of UN established, and of course, uh, 75 years ago we had at the Bruton Wood uh, uh, conference. We had the uh, uh, world leaders then uh, decided to launch UN, basically to prevent uh, a third world war. And uh, so, 75 years we've been uh, relatively successful on that in terms of preventing the third world war. But then. Uh, where now we are expected hit by this uh, world virus war, and uh, which is uh, also very devastating and a huge impact. Uh, so I think you know the the uh, the, the the major powers like uh, like the U.S., China, EU, and uh, uh, Japan, and you know many other countries, we should really work together uh, that uh, to to fight this pandemic. But but also uh, it reminds us, you know, this pandemic probably coming from nature. And if we don't respect uh, uh, the climate, uh, respect nature and respect uh, the ecological environment that we are in, we, we probably go, uh, the human beings may be punished uh, uh, even more, more so uh, uh, in the future. So it's really a uh, high time that we, 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 we really uh, uh, think hard and also act on these uh, uh, ideas of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, uh, 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 you know, excited to see that the topic is that foreign policy really is the climate policy, because that is probably one of the biggest, uh, uh, you know, challenge facing our humankind. I think what uh, President Xi and President Trump and uh, and EU leaders all have said something uh, on the uh, climate change at the UN uh, General Assembly. I I'm very pleased that the President Xi uh, stressed that China will peak by 2030, which is only 10 years from now. And a neutralized carbon, and uh, uh, you know, by uh, uh, 2060. So, so that's a huge uh, uh, objective. I think China uh, needs to accomplish. And uh, and but then, what 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 are the global uh, system that we're going to have? Uh, we already have uh, China, U.S. Uh, you know, accounts uh, almost half of world GDP, and uh, and emit uh, you know 40 40 some percent is of a global emission. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, we have this uh, uh, you know, economic globalization. We already have a lot of governance uh, in the past, but ecological globalization, what are the, what are the mechanism? What are the, uh, you know, uh, framework? What are the, what are the structure there? I mean, we, uh, we already have a Paris Accord, but, uh, but unfortunately I think US is, is pulling out of that, but how we can really uh, further that. So, so I think that uh, now even more new players is coming on uh, like India, like, uh, you know, developing countries, African maybe in, in many years to come. So, so we, we really need to uh, work on this very hard. I, I think probably something can be done is that, uh, you know, we already have a, a Paris Accord. We should, you know, maybe uh, sit down and then um, particularly China and US on how we can really be the two largest polluters in the world, how we can really, uh, you know, uh, get, a, get a consensus on, on, the, on this uh, climate change deal. And also, we, we need more uh, uh, rule-based, uh, uh, you know, the framework for 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 contacting the challenges and also issues. I, I think that uh, you know exactly uh, 21st century diplomacy. We should really think, you know, 
we're probably difficult to have a, 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 a nuclear war or, or military war now because uh, it's really a, a mutually assured uh, destruction. Uh, so we really need to uh, be uh, 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 aware that uh, from a mutually assured destruction uh, to mutually assured dependency, where we are now in a, 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 a same planet, we have only one planet and we have to really you know, cherish the, the environment we, we, we live in. As a matter of fact, I mean, the, uh, the, the temperatures keep uh, rising uh, and then, uh, you know, even in China, the, the last five years probably is the most uh, warm five years uh, in the past, uh, probably many parts of the world. And, uh, and also every 10 years, uh, the temperature goes up a, a, a quarter degrees uh, uh, centigrade and uh, also sea level is, uh, is rising above, uh, also increasing probably uh, every 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 year as well. So so we we're really facing a very uh, huge task. So so I think that it's really great. That think tanks uh, like, like media and, and all the people that particularly EU, uh, US, and China. That if we can really as a track to uh, uh, dialogue and we can really find ways to cope with the uh, the situation. Uh, like now we already have a G7 mechanism, uh, but can we add India, uh, China, Russian uh, into that? So that, uh, you know, the, the emission probably of those 10 countries is almost uh, taking half of the world uh, 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 by that already. So, so I think that, that would be really a great uh, way to, uh, to confront that. I mean, we had a financial crisis, we have a G20, now we have this pandemic, we have now have this climate change uh, threats and the challenge. Uh, you know, pandemic already uh, sounds the alarm bell for us already, and I think the uh, the climate change is really is coming. Uh, you know, we have so many <laughs> fires and uh, floods and uh, you know threats everywhere, and uh, you know we, we really should learn the lesson from this pandemic, and we should really be prepared. And then you know uh, the most uh, um, biggest ten countries in the world, I think, really should work together and uh, on that. So, so I think that uh, I probably I just uh, uh, you know stop here, and uh, I really hope that uh, mechanisms like uh, uh, this 21st century project, like this uh, uh, foreign policies, climate policy, is really uh, sending a strong signal to the community uh, internationally and to the policymakers, think tankers, industries, industrial uh, companies that we really should put our act together and then work together and uh, set aside the geolo geopolitical or ideological differences. Maybe we should really work hard on those uh, life and death and the threats to the human being as a whole. And uh, I, I'm sure that the scientific and uh, international uh, uh, business community, policy community can really work together on this. And I'm, I'm, I really want to congratulate on, on the efforts that uh, you take and Wilson and all the think tanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Um, we come back to um, the, the, um, the idea that you raised about new modes of multilateralism later in the discussion of um, be that the club structure of the G20, G7, or whatever um, alternative uh, alliances of ambitious countries uh, could be. Uh, I would like to turn to uh, Sharon. Sharon, um, in, in the US, the climate discourse seemed to be heavily populized, politicized, polarized, um, and uh, particularly with this bird's eye perspective on the recent announcement of China, uh, the question is whether marketing technology then can solve the problem uh, in paving the way into a decarbonized um, uh, future, um, given the, the role of the US government. What could be the role in, of the US government in the future? Yeah, it's a... Uh... You know, certainly from the vantage of uh, the news that I just woke up to here, it's a reminder that sort of the the arc of American history sometimes bends in the direction of a roller coaster. So it's been a low point for us on climate change and and on a, a many things, but we are, we will rise. We are rising. So I think that's an important thing too is that our form of government allows for us to adjust and to correct course. And the question is, can we get off the ride and just continue to stay? at a high point. I think an important thing when you look at US policy, even with the polarization that we have here, which I, I believe is coming to an end for us, but even with that polarization, US emissions has still, have still been declining in recent years. And even as our GDP has been rising. So our economy is getting bigger, our emissions are getting smaller. And it's a, it's a, it's a hopeful 
sign for for everyone that this is possible and we're not the only ones but i think it's a very important uh, uh statement of what's really happening here so we've had a president who's rolled back our fuel efficiency standards our our uh, appliance efficiency standards has increased our pollution um but even as that has happened we've had a lot of activity at the subnational level in our cities and states both in terms of improving our resilience to disasters and cutting greenhouse gas emissions. We've had businesses, the private sector has been very robust leaning into this, including social media platforms that, that cite their, their businesses according to where there's clean energy. They've had a very important effect on emissions here. We've had philanthropies that have given billions of dollars in the United States and around the world to promote a better climate change policy. And even on an individual level, Americans are very generous about their giving. And even as we've had a president who every year has tried to cut foreign aid, our foreign aid levels have stayed the same. And so we continue to finance globally you know, climate change policies. And as you say, climate change policy is foreign policy. And I think that's been true in some quarters that wherever you improve uh, maternal health, you're, you're improving climate resilience. Those investments have continued for the United States. So what are we going to see? Okay, our private sector gets it and increasingly uh, gets it more. We've been, we've been uh, engaging in this project where we've been talking to people at the local level all over the country about how they're actually dealing with climate change. And that's been really instructive, including that, you know, we talked to this one business that's a large manufacturing uh, equipment maker worldwide who's leaning into climate policy. Um, they're not waiting to be told at the by the chief executive. So also I think the Trump reversals are gonna get thrown out. That'll, that'll be reversed and it will turn out to be a blip that doesn't change our trajectory. My dog is saying hello. I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm not squeaking. That is my dog um, who is saying hello to all of you. Um, <laughs> and actually is probably lobbying me for a walk. So um, also I think we're gonna see a green recovery plan here that, that looks at investments in innovation and research and development uh, clean energy research and development. And also, I think it's not always just clean energy. There are a lot of other things that we can do to our the way we live that change our footprint. We're going to see a green recovery here, and those investments are going to change uh, you know, our infrastructure, our research, and everything, and that will also change the footprint. So, you know, it, the United States has continued to improve on this, and I believe that, you know, we will, uh, as a country, course correct in a month, and then we will see all of these changes come too. So uh, I think that's what we can expect from the United States. I can't hear you. Um, I know you're making fun of me, but I can't hear you. Because <laughs> you're smirking, I can tell. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, no, I'm not making fun, but uh, basically you provided a pretty positive picture and um, I think it's uh, interesting, I think, and, and that corresponds a little bit with the, um, with, uh, with the observation by many analysts to say that uh, President Xi's announcement uh, is crucial and can be a game changer, uh, but it's at a very high political level, but it contradicts a little bit with the kind of investment into coal, uh, the kind of investment uh, that China announced uh, 58 gigawatts uh, this year just for the first six months is the equivalent of almost a quarter um, of, of the U.S. existing capacities, etc. You tr have a different picture, uh, the U.S. government being much less ambitious at global level, but uh, technology-wise and at sub-state level, uh, there is progress and you see that, uh, that uh, emissions are declining. Um, Ursula von der Leyen uh, seems to be very uh, ambitious and at the forefront of that game on raising ambitious by making claims of uh, reducing faster and achieving climate neutrality faster. Uh, Henrich, um, how, how important is uh, for a foreign policy maker in Germany climate policy, both domestic and the European? Now you have to unmute. Yes, okay. okay. I saw that. Okay, good. Um, thank you for, for, for this question. Um, as opposed to what Sharon just told us about the US, I think what is interesting that we see in Europe 
a fairly broad political consensus when it comes to climate protection. And this is really reassuring. We've seen changes of governments in Europe as well. We have seen, let's say, swings from left to right, from right to left. But what, what seemed to be the bottom line of all of this is that nobody's really seriously putting in question the ambitions of the European Union. You mentioned the announcement by the Commission President to sharpen our 2030 goal to a reduction of minus 55%. So, this, so we're far beyond, let's say, peaking uh, CO2. We will have shelved off more than half of our emissions uh, within 10 years. I think that's a, that's a big, a big achievement, and it's also a big political gesture. And on top of it all, we want to put this into a climate law, a European climate law, to really make it politically and legally binding. I think this is really something big. Um, one should also mention the European Green Deal. Uh, we should also know that 30% of all investments um, that will be made for the recovery plan are devoted to sustainable projects, uh, looking into energy efficiency, climate protection, and so forth. And all of this, I think, um, is key and is vital, is essential for having credibility when talking about climate change on an international level. How can we encourage other partners better to also be ambitious if we set a good example and if we show that it's also painful for us, but it's also possible and we are ready to invest in, in this direction. Um, but apart from doing our homework, I think we need also to look around and see um, what kind of contribution can foreign policy make to, on the one hand, um, um, speeding up, uh, creating more ambition for climate protection and helping to implement the Paris Agreement. But on the other hand, we need to understand uh, to what extent is foreign policy and our foreign policy questions uh, um, influenced and, and overshadowed by climate change. And I think we would all agree that climate change serves as a stress multiplier. We would all agree that climate change and security uh, do have close uh, close links. And this is why we, for example, uh, engaged uh, on a debate in the UN Security Council, and we would have hoped, we would have loved to see all members of the UN Security Council to, to buy into this concept that the Security Council should look into climate change as a key driver of conflict, as a key reinforcer of conflict, and that the Security Council should um, and, and munition itself should prepare itself to better look at this issue and to better operationalize uh, its action uh, also with contextual information and contextual input from the climate change field. Um, I believe it's also key to understand better what lies, uh, what lies ahead of us and therefore the um, Foreign Office has commissioned a study again together with Adelphi, so I'm doing some advertising here. Uh, it's called Global Climate Security Risk and Foresight Assessment. So it's going to be a comprehensive study that should answer many of the questions that still are open today as to what effects we can expect as to which extent does climate change drive instability, fragility, and what does it all mean for the foreign policy agenda? And I think this is going to be a, a big contribution. Um, and because it's big, it will take some time. So we expect a full report to be ready by 2023. But by then we will have some authoritative source to, to inform and, and, and feed into the political discussion about climate change and security. Thank you, Henrich. Um, <clears throat> um, I would like to move on to, to the second topic just briefly because it has been raised the question of the, the competition among the superpowers. I mean, basically, there is this attitude to say that uh, climate working jointly on climate efforts um, um, in open markets, on it, it has to do with, uh, with technology leadership, but technology leadership also involves competition. What do you think about the kind of competition? We had a couple of authors um, in our essays making the argument that exploring resources in the Arctic, uh, reshoring uh, parts of the uh, economy, uh, I think very much driven on both sides of the Atlantic at the moment and, and, and experiences the, the effects of the pandemic. Um, that doesn't tell us that uh, technology cooperation uh, between US, China and the EU is very high on the agenda. The opposite is the case. Do you think that, uh, that, that that's the case and what could we do about it? Maybe Sharon, you want to start? Sure. Uh, and I, uh, the first answer I have to give, especially after listening to Henrich, is that um, 
without question, the EU is the moral center when it comes to, if you're, if you're gonna talk about climate superpowers, that the European Union has been leading the way and is the moral center. And I think that will continue to be very important, certainly for, I think, for a revived US-European partnership, but also for, for how the United States, China are, are going to work together, that the European Union is gonna to continue to play a critical hinge role um, and continue to be the moral center. So I think you can't discount how important that is. You know, as for the tensions between superpowers, and in this case, you know, certainly we're talking about the United States and China. I think, you know, those we have different approaches to the world and different systems of government, and that's going to continue to generate many tensions. And I think what concerns me, especially as someone who comes out of the defense sector, is that both countries are girding for the fight, and that we seem to be moving down a path towards a, a grim future relative to each other, that this increasingly adversarial relationship, I, the question I have in that is where does that end? And it, it ends nowhere good for either country or for anyone in the world. And until both of our countries have a vision for coexistence that includes the success of each other um, and our collective success, then I think we're in a very dangerous place. So. Our climate change cooperation inevitably is going to be, a, a, you know, a facet of that overall really dangerous situation. However, you know, so I think we can't succeed fully on climate change as two superpowers unless we're addressing that bigger problem that we have, that we are not on in a good place relative to each other. However, I will say that I also think that climate change has the potential to be a very important confidence building measure between the United States and China, because no matter what else is happening in our relationship, we can succeed together on climate change and there are investments that we can do together. Um, there is collaboration we can do no matter what else is happening in the relationship. And it's to our mutual benefit, no matter what, and not only ours, but the rest of the world cannot succeed in this unless we succeed the United States and China on our own terms and also together. So um, I do think that the overall context of that relationship is dangerous, but we can still come together on climate change, whether it's track two as, as Henry mentioned, or uh, whether it, but also at an official level. So, you know, those are my concerns about the tension between superpowers. You're, you're still muted, Alexander. Sorry, somebody mutes me. Um, <clears throat> Adam Tews in Foreign Policy uh, wrote an interesting article in response to uh, President Xi's announcement just a couple of days ago, uh, saying that basically the US is going to lose out in that game because there will be a closer cooperation between EU and China on environmental technologies and climate technologies. Uh, that is supposed to be part of the EU-China summit in Leipzig um, um, uh, that, that was planned and it's going to be part of um, the future announcement and preparations for the next COP in, in Glasgow. Um, what, what do you think, how would this kind of cooperational uh, arrangement would look like when it, uh, when it comes to avoiding reshoring technologies, uh, avoiding the kind of battle that we have seen um, on market dominance in battery production or uh, the disappearance of, um, um, of uh, the solar industry in Europe? Dr. Wang? Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> Oh, oh, great. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, Sherry has, uh, Sharon has raised many uh, uh, stimulating uh, points and also some good questions. I, I, I share quite a bit of that. I, I do think that uh, uh, China, um, uh, US and EU needs to work, work together on this. Uh, I'm glad you, uh, Alex, mentioned about China-EU summit, and then, which is uh, not, not uh, too long ago, that a virtual summit uh, where I see that China and the EU has established a green uh, a dialogue, uh, a platform that they, both, both leaders agreed that uh, they're going to have a, a green uh, a dialogue. And also uh, another dialogue is the digital economy. So that they realize that uh, the EU and China has something in common and uh, they, can, they can really further explore that. I, I also think that uh, uh, right now that uh, we, 
I mean, the world, particularly for the U.S.-China relation, uh, as uh, as Sharon has mentioned, it's unfortunately it has gone sour, you know, quite a bit uh, in recent years. But uh, you know, for the, from what I can see in the, in the past several years during the Trump administrations, that of course we 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 only probably worked on the trade. So we, even though we had a phase one, but then uh, President Trump has pulled out the Paris Accord and the WHO and even threatened putting up a WTO. So, so there's not many area that US China can have a dialogue. What I can see, uh, I watched the debate that, uh, you know, uh, Vice President Biden, if he, uh, you know, wins the election, then he will come back to the Paris Accord as he uh, stated. And he will be uh, coming back to WHO and uh, maybe even reform WTO or, or even CPTPP uh, that he's interested in probably coming back. So, so I think you know that that will provide a, a quite a few more platform for US and China to talk and exchange, and then uh, that probably may reduce a little bit of this hawkish, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, military uh, kind of a uh, hot war that uh, that that seems uh, uh, you know uh, getting a little worse uh, every other day. Uh, so, so I think that is really important that U.S. China uh, keeping the dialogue, just like China and EU leadership, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Chinese top leaders has pledged this uh, 2030 and 2060 target. Target is really great. I mean, China is always likes to work with a target. Uh, so uh, people don't like China 2025. Okay, how, how about 2030 and 2060? Let's work on something uh, more, more, more with common objective. And China's always have a five years plan. Now it's in 14 years five span, five years plan now. So I think if China set up a target, China probably going to realize that. Don't, uh, you know, don't underestimate China. For example, China doesn't have a national uh, fast speed train network. Now China built up the fast speed train network, uh, which accounts two thirds of the world, the total land now. And China has the uh, pledge to have a 5G network. China now have the vast, uh, most advanced 5G network in the world. And that was a, a billion smartphone users now. So, so what I'm thinking is that uh, if they set a target, I'm sure they're probably going to, uh, you know, uh, try to achieve that. But of course, this has to be uh, working with the international community together. I think particularly with the technology that uh, US, EU, and other countries have. And also, uh, we need also, uh, uh, I'm glad that uh, this dialogue, this conference uh, today has said in the climate, 21st century diplomacy, 21st century climate, uh, diplomacy is really uh, should we should raise that uh, awareness uh, that you know people shouldn't really uh, think of how we can uh, fight with each other. Let's fight with uh, with a pandemic. Let's fight with uh, uh, climate change. Uh, so uh, here's you know maybe just I want to end with a few uh, concrete proposals. For example, why can't we have this uh, uh, UN you know that can continue uh, get more uh, uh, you know uh, fine tuning this Paris Accord? I mean what what. What's the problem U.S. have? Let's talk again. Maybe let's 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 settle that again. But but also let's have a. Why don't we have a climate G10? You know, I mean, uh, G7 plus uh, China, India, and uh, and uh, and uh, also uh, uh, you know Russia. Let's have a G10 on climate, a G10 summit on climate. So maybe that you know let's focus on something like just like G G20 on financial crisis. Let's have a G10. On, on climate crisis, so so and pandemic crisis, maybe that is something we could do. But also, I'm I'm, I'm also pleased to see that uh, uh, civil society, NGOs, uh, foundations are doing great. So I, I I'm 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 serving on the uh, Paris Peace Forum uh, uh, steering committee, whereas the Paris Peace Forum is calling for President Macron is calling for this uh, uh, you know non-government uh, vertical globalization, non-government uh, proposal from. Uh, from civil society on cope, uh, cope with the uh, climate change. And we have many good examples of, of that. NGOs, maybe let's uh, multiply that. And also uh, we should really get the companies really working together. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the Fortune 500, I mean, now China uh, ha has already passed the US now on Fortune 500. Let's get all the big companies uh, be responsible and, uh, and work on the climate change, uh, uh, new rules and, and, and the new standards. And also, finally, we should probably working with uh, uh, you know at, at the provincial level. I mean, like China working with California on some kind of a, uh, in a climate change project, and maybe a provincial, state, uh, regional governments should really you know not do to be at the mercy of the federal government. Let's do something also on that as well. And and finally, I think that uh, all those international treaties we should have the climate change element of that. 
For example, China now is interested to join the CPTPP, and the CPTPP has the course on environmental protection and green uh, standards there too. So, uh, so maybe if the US comes back and we can talk about that. And also WTO, I mean, uh, I was at a WTO public forum uh, last year. I proposed that for the plastic emission to the ocean, uh, that we should, you know, WTO should set up standards and should ban the production or maybe circulation of, of plastic uh, uh, waste on that. And uh, so, so I mean, G20 already have a, a object to, to have an emission to zero to ocean by 2050. So let's really put this into that and really finalize that. So as many ways I think we can work concretely, but I'm glad that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we are talking now today with all the great report you have. So this is really a, a very good incentive. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Very good uh, uh, points. And I think uh, you enriched the list of things uh, we need to, to work on um, over the next couple of years to explore this uh, from the G10 into other arrangements that you suggested. Um, I would like to ask Hinrich one thing. Um, in the beginning, when we designed this project and thinking about um, the, the climate superpowers, to be honest, in my more European, maybe too much moral uh, perspective that I had, Sharon, um, I was not thinking so much uh, about you US and China. That's true. That's one of the things. But my question is, are there different environmental or climate superpowers emerging um, beyond? Because it's quite striking that uh, when we talk about climate, we still talk about a bipolar world. I mean, basically, US and China, and maybe in between, there is a role for Europe. Yes, there's definitely one. But could we imagine other coalitions coming up? Uh, you mentioned a couple of already, the UI. And um, um, about the, with those countries that, that were very ambitious, that are embarking on a decarbonized world, uh, maybe even beyond national governments, coalitions that we could imagine as su at sub-state level. Hinrich, could, could you imagine when you think about the superpowers, is that where you take the role of Europe as the, the third in the game, or are, is, is that a a proliferation of smaller settings, as Dr. Wong said, the, the G send the club structures that are that are increasing and flourishing. Am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Um, thank you, Alexander. I reflected a bit about the notion of climate superpowers when I was listening to my fellow panelists, and I was wondering whether this is an appropriate term because on on the one hand, one could say a climate superpower is a country or region that adds extremely much to global CO2 emissions. So this would be the 9% share of the European Union. So we have a biggest share. So we are a climate superpower or in more, let's say, explicit terms, a climate super polluter. Um, but could we perhaps put this around and say, why don't we have a, a global scale and, and perhaps judging who is a climate superpower by what kind of positive contribution a country makes. So how many megatons of CO2 has one country actively taken out of emissions? Um, what kind of percentage of CO2 emissions has one country perhaps helped to get out by supporting other parts of the world and being more climate friendly and pursuing more sustainable policies? And I, would, I was just wondering whether it would be in theory possible to draw up such a chart and such a scoring board to see who's actually making the biggest effort to protecting the world's climate. So perhaps this, this is something that where it, where it gets interesting and attractive to being a climate superpower, uh, as opposed to being one of the biggest polluters. Um, and of course, um, in a 21st diplomacy setting, we need to be creative and flexible. So we will have to look around for new alliances. And uh, one alliance that Germany has pushed for hard in the last past 12 months is an alliance that we call Alliance for Multilateralism. And this is not something which is a theoretical concept uh, because we like international organizations so much, but we strongly believe and we are convinced that the multilateral um, international setup that we have is, 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 is the setup that is best qualified for tackling these global challenges. So looking at the climate change challenge from the perspective of what kind of multilateral options and fora do we have is something that seems to me very interesting and very important. Beyond this, beyond the, the state level, and, and somebody mentioned this before, there are other actors that play a leading role and certainly they have done so in the past couple of years 
three and a half years in the US. These were cities and states. So be below the national levels, I think there are strong actors that have not fully been taken into account as serious partners for us, for governments and for, for, for countries. And um, I think there's the so-called C40 network of cities that certainly does play a very constructive role here and should, that should um, perhaps get renewed attention and more, more focus in the international debate. Another interesting example is the Power and Pass Coal Alliance, uh, of which Germany is a member, and that looks beyond um, fossil fuel, beyond coal as an energy source um, in uh, about 30 countries. And uh, that's something that helps us to, to embark on the necessary transition of the energy sector and the economy at large. And finally, I'd like to point out that together with the state of Nauru in the Southwest Pacific, Germany has established the Group of Friends on Climate and Security in the context of the United Nations. It's a group that regularly meets, that regularly discusses issues of climate change and with the aim of, of giving the UN Security Council and the UN agenda in general a sharper focus on uh, climate change and security. But I'm sure we can think of many more alliances and many more partnerships. And as a, as a, as a, a general rule, I would, um, let's say, appeal to colleagues, to, to, to foreign policy decision makers and diplomatic services to be as creative as possible here, to look beyond the usual box of diplomatic tools and instruments and, and just think about what can be the best forum, the best platform and the best, uh, the, the best suited partner to help me make make a progress on international. Okay, thank you, Hinrich. Uh, the rest is still online? Yeah, I think. Um, you say uh, we, as diplomats, we have to be as creative um, as possible. And, um, but as a matter of fact, the international existing multilateral system leaves very little room for the more progressive sub-state actors that exist. And it was interesting that Sharon, when, when you described the situation in the US, that uh, given that uh, compared to GDP, um, uh, energy efficiency was increasing, uh, global emissions or overall emissions went down, uh, that was basically not driven by federal programs, but basically within states and a couple of cities. We observe a, a similar situation also in Europe where much of, particularly when it comes to uh, trans, um, the, 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 the transition in the mobility sector that much of the ambition is coming from smaller and larger cities in Europe that demonstrates on, uh, basically on, on, on how to, 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 to kick off and how to demonstrate how flexible we can be in order to explore things. What's, when we think about the current international system and basically that's operated by diplomacy, where are the constraints and how can we deal with that to bring this kind of ambition then to the negotiation table, wherever, whether that is in a club structure among states or whether that is uh, at the UN? Uh, well, Alexander, I think, you know, what you just said is the heart of it, right? Is that it, it's so, it's such a compelling, important international issue and a collective challenge. But at the same time, it, it has to, a couple of basic foundations have to be there. And one is local action, domestic action, that all of our success in global negotiations and global action are going to be built on domestic success and on local success. So we have to keep in mind that that's going to continue to be the sort of proof point. Are you succeeding at home? Are you moving forward at home? Who are you at home and who are you in the world? How do you conduct yourself in the world are going to continue to be the number one distinguishing characteristic about how we succeed together. Um, I think also a, a basic foundation here is gonna be trust. And that um, certainly my country has some trust to rebuild, but we're not the only country that has to prove that you can trust us, that you can trust with intellectual property if we're all gonna share innovations, that you can trust with how you're going to treat your neighbors and other countries, that trust is gonna be a very important part of building this multilateralism. I, I also think that uh, you know, reading the collection of essays that you pulled together, um, you know, one thing that's really clear is that 
there's going to be some things we really do need to negotiate multilaterally and collectively. Um, and that, you know, so for example, geoengineering, both of the pieces on that in the collection were very compelling that this is something that the nations of the world have to come together on to figure out a regime. There is no substitute for a multilateral gathering on those kinds of issues. At the same time, I think it's time for us to sort of operationalize our climate change policy, foreign policy. And what I mean by that is that um, the, the focus to date has really been on negotiations and on coming to some kind of collective plan. But I think we, uh, we really need to focus on actually making the investments, um, you know, the collective investments and the collective action to cut emissions and to improve resilience, that that should be the focus. And that does require, you know, what your signal point with this project is, is integrating climate change into everything we do in our foreign policy and, and, and you know, coming back to that domestic foundation too. So we have to move away from a policy that's just centered in negotiations and environmental ministries and make this a collective investment challenge. And, um, you know, I, Sue Binney as a, a State Department, former State Department negotiator and lawyer who contributed to your project, she made a really interesting case too, that, you know, you can't have a one size fits all multilateral solution that you have to be willing to look at bilateral, mini lateral, you know, that there's a, there's a basket of things. The G20 certainly offers a very rich uh, possibility for, for cooperation there. And, um, that we've got to be flexible as far as what's going to work on on formalizing uh, climate change, and I think also there's a real danger in there of of a free rider problem. That we got to make sure that that action is following words when it comes to climate change, and that that we don't have countries that are going to continue to buy a lot of fossil fuels, and and just hide behind everyone else's commitments and and uh, language because. You know that there's going to be as people move away from fossil fuels, there will be more supply and the prices will go down. So I think the temptation to free ride on that is going to be very strong, and that's one of the things that we'll have to put into international negotiations. Okay, thank you, Sharon. A uh, kind of a closing remark. Um, I would like to thank everybody. Time is over. Um, uh, I very much enjoyed the discussion. Uh, I think you contributed also and made a couple of very good suggestions of what needs to be explored. As I said in the beginning, this is not just a report. 21st century diplomacy, foreign policy is climate policy. It's just the beginning of a larger project. Um, the Woodrow Wilson Center, I was told by Lauren Risi, uh, is going to welcome two fellows who start working now on, on two of the central questions uh, that we raised in this report um, um, at the Wilson Center. Uh, we at Adelphi are going to continue with that. And it was a true partnership because we invited um, authors uh, by uh, 28 different organizations to work with us um, and they take that forward. Um, I would like to um, just uh, highlight one thing and I think that's the challenge that we want to do collectively. You were talking about collective investment um, and the toolbox and I think that is crucial to think about um, how creative and all of you said this either in the contributions that you provided here in the discussions but also in your written uh, op-eds that you have contributed to this uh, report uh, that we have to be very creative in what we are doing. So that starts with club structures, that starts with a, a wide range of mini and micro and nation to city level cooperation. I think where diplomacy can be more creative um, as they've been so far, because it's often said that it's basically country to country. Um, and, um, and we've seen, as Hendrich said, that uh, initiatives like the C40, where more than 100 cities, larger cities, uh, engage in cl as climate leaders there. Um, they also provide a platform for the proliferation of technological, but also societal solutions to address the climate cl crisis. So that needs to be on the, uh, on the desk of, um, of diplomats. And, and I think that, uh, that uh, we want to contribute to the further development of how this toolbox could look like. I would like to thank everybody here, uh, all you, um, uh, Dr. Wang in, uh, in Beijing, Sharon in Washington, Henrich in Berlin. Uh, I say goodbye here from Portugal. 
Um, and I would like to thank the audience, more than 100 participants um, who joined us. Whoever wants to join the discussion, as I said, go to the project website and um, engage in the discussion that we have at the moment on social media on this topic. I would like to thank everybody. I would like to specially thank Lauren Risi for the fruitful cooperation and I look forward to continue. Thank you and I wish everybody a good day or a good night and uh, a drink, a tea or a coffee.